Okay. So good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to my presentation. I'll start by saying a little bit about myself. My name is Matthias Tyson. I'm a uh, long-term known and Fedora contributor. I've been involved with uh, both these projects since at least 2004. So that, that's been quite a while. But, uh, today I'm going to present about something new. We've started doing in Fedora just this year. Uh, I'm a little uncertain about that. Um, I have not talked about this project before, so we'll see how that goes. Uh, but, uh, before going further, I should probably say a little bit about what uh, Fedora Silver Blue is, since the name does not really give it away. So Silver Blue is uh, a desktop operating system, just like Fedora Workstation is, or any other thing you can run on your laptop. And um, I'll talk a little bit about how it's different and very new compared to other things that we have done on, in that area before. So let's dive right in. So these are the highlights that I want you to take away from this presentation. If you don't remember anything else but these three points, then I've really um, achieved my goal here today. Um, and I'll talk about these three things in some more detail during the presentation. So Silver Blue really is just Fedora. So if you know Fedora, then Silver Blue is not something uh, unfamiliar to you. And the name is just a name. A little weird, but maybe it sticks and uh, that you remember. And containers are really great technology. There's a lot of talks here this weekend about containers. Everybody wants to use containers, and Silverblue is supposed to make containers fun and easy. At least that's what we're hoping to achieve. So I'll um, start by talking about the first point. Silverblue is really just Fedora. And I'm stressing that here explicitly because when we started this project at the beginning of this year, there was some concern inside the Fedora community that we were trying to build a new distro, maybe outside Fedora, maybe a competitor, and um, how does that go together with us being part of Fedora? So this is a project that we, we really do inside Fedora. It's just another, another offering of the Fedora project, not something outside of no, Fedora. And it is really a continuation of something that we had before. Put that here at the first bullet point. There was something called Fedora Atomic Workstation. It has been around for a few years since Fedora 25, which is now almost three years ago. And um, it has even been presented here at last year's Gone Asia, I believe. David King talked about that last year, if I remember correctly. So it's not brand new, um, but it has been a bit under the covers. It was like a little side project that not too many people knew about. Fedora Workstation is, of course, the one of the four or three major editions that the Fedora project produces regularly. And the Atomic Workstation is a variant of that, of the Fedora Workstation that we have been um, working on on the side as a little back project. And Silverblue is basically taking that and making it um, something that we actually want to show off. And it is built from Fedora RPMs, just like any other uh, offering that Fedora has. And uh, in that regard, it's just like anything else that you could get from the Fedora project. It's a little different than how we deliver it to the end user. So we're using OS3 to um, get the OS image onto, the, onto your laptop or the end user system, and we use uh, Flatpak applications. I'll talk a bit more about these points. Um, but first, I want to talk a little more about the name, why we chose a new name, and um, for about you, but when I hear workstation, um, Something like this comes to mind, like a really old Spark station from the 90s. It's really maybe a floppy drive somewhere on the side, and we expect it to really boot up slowly and be black and white. So that's not really modern and not what we use every day. And the other part of the name, Atomic Workstation, may sound cool to people who know where it comes from and what it means, like us as geeks. But for the rest of the population, the first thing that comes to mind is maybe nuclear waste, so that sounds dangerous and not the greatest combination for marketing. And one of the goals with um, Fedora server rules that we want to kind of reach new audiences for Fedora and, and go out and maybe make people try Fedora that have not heard about it before. And, um, so we want to have a name that does not uh, pre preclude that from happening. So first impressions do count when you want to go out and reach new people. And um, so we chose um, a new name and a new logo and We've made a new website and we are trying to use new communication channels. Um, here you can see the logo that uh, Jacob Steiner drew for us. 
it looks a little bit like a leaf. The first name, we, our first favorite name was Silver Leaf, so that kind of reflects in the logo still. The name, unfortunately, didn't quite work out uh, in the end, so we ended up using Silver Blue. Um, and we made a new website, you can go there, there's the link down there. And um, we started um, doing some outreach on Twitter, and um, we also tried to do something new for communication. Traditionally, Fedora and many open source projects use mailing lists for communication, which works well for us old-timers who have done email since the 90s. But other people um, communicate in other ways nowadays. So we have a web forum. Um, down there has the link, discussion.fedoraproject.org, which is using Discourse, which is just a, a web forum. And it's a lot friendlier, I feel, and, and more, a more modern way to communicate. And um, now, actually, uh, I was at a, a Fedora conference just this last week, and Fedora is actually discussing adopting discourse more widely for other projects as well, just to make it easier for people to find us and communicate in ways that are not so musty at all. Right, so um, as I said, the Atomic Workstation has existed for a few years and it was a little side project and it was actually hosted inside this umbrella project called Project Atomic, which you may or may not have heard about. That was, um, as I said, an umbrella project that um, um, we set up to um, build the Atomic, Fedora Atomic Host and the Atomic Workstation and a bunch of other tools for containers also have their own there, things like Hotman, Builder, and Scopio, you may or may not have heard of these tools. Um, they are all in the container context and uh, make it easier to work with containers. And uh, Atomic Hosts was, li was living there. Um, and we started um, the Silver Blue Initiative this, this uh, winter at DevConf in Renault. That was in February. And when we did that, we did not know yet that Red Hat was going to buy or acquire ProOS. We all learned about that on the plane home from from that one, so we were surprised, and um, it was kind of a, a good coincidence that this happened after we decided to do Silver Blue because it has taken a few months, but by now it has become clear that um, the way Red Hat wants to use CoreOS is to basically um, disband the Project Atomic umbrella and instead merge the Atomic host with uh, CoreOS, and it's going to become Fedora CoreOS as another part of the Fedora project. And that means that Project Atomic basically goes away and we need to find a new home for Silver Blue anyway. Uh, we need to find a new home for the Atomic Workstation and Silver Blue is basically just that. It, it worked out really nicely that way. And the other projects that, that were also hosted uh, as part of Project Atomic will find other, other homes uh, in the new Container Tools initiative as this all gets uh, sorted out and reshuffled. Yeah, now I want, to, um, I want to talk a little more about um, what, what makes uh, Silver Blue different from our regular workstation offering. And um, one way to uh, explain it is to say that Silver Blue is actually very similar to another operating system that uh, some people have built using GNOME called NGSOS, which uh, you may or may not have heard about. Um, so, Silver Blue and NGSOS share uh, quite a few qualities. They're both image based, and when I say that, I mean a few things. One is that um, the actual operating system that you install on your laptop, what's usually mounted as slash user, is read only. So you, you cannot just install a new package and change what's, what's in there. Whenever you want to make a change, you actually have to reboot to get into the new image. So that, that's one aspect of image based. Another important aspect of image space is that um, the switch over, as I said, always requires a reboot, so it is atomic, which is where the name atomic came from. It's a really important quality, so you don't end up with mixed states where you say you start to install this big update, but halfway through your power went out, and now your system has like half the packages installed and half the packages not, and you don't really know if you can recover from this mess, mixed up state. Uh, with atomic updates, you always either run the old image or the new image, there's no in between, and that makes it a lot safer. And it's also, it makes it easy to do things like rollbacks, I mentioned that here, because after you reboot it into the new image, the old image is still around somewhere, so if you find a problem with what you just installed, you can just 
reboot again and be back in the old system, which um, really helps um, avoiding fatal situations around updates and upgrades and makes it easier to, to try new things. Just try the update. If it doesn't work, you can go back. Um, yeah, I already said um, the way the image based, um, the, this image based uh, quality is implemented is using OS3, which is um, just a tool that uh, facilitates that. I'm not going to like, go too deep into the technology uh, for this. Um, I will say here that we are using, for the server, we'll be using a variation of OS3, which is called RPM OS3. It uses the same repository and disk formats uh, for storing things, uh, but RPM OS3 adds a little, um, it adds some nice level of integration with um, the RPM ecosystem that, that we built this in, that all ships everything in RPM packages. So it's nice to have that. RPM OS3 uh, has some knowledge of packages, for instance, uh, in our in our Silverblue um, system, you still have an RPM database. You can still easily find out what are all the packages that were used to create your your local system. It may not be installed using individual packages, but you can still find out which packages went into creating the, the OS, so that, that's a useful source of information. It also makes it possible um, to still deal with packages um, in your local system. I'll talk a little bit more about that later. You can do something about package layering, which is interesting in, in some ways. Yeah, but um, another aspect in which Silverblue is sim similar to Endless is that we are using Flatpak for installing applications. And um, maybe you've seen David's presentation yesterday where he talked about Flatpak a little bit. Um, Flatpak is nice in that it helps us uh, isolate or cleanly separate the applications from the OS. For the OS, it's immutable at runtime. We want to like, create it as a fixed foundation, and then you can just install and update applications at their own pace using Flatpak. And um, that is entirely independent of whether you update your OS or not. And it is also very safe. Uh, updating a Flatpak, um, you can do that while the application is running, and nothing bad will happen in the past with RPMs. That was not always the case. You might end up in a situation where you run DNF update on your Fedora system, and then your web browser starts misbehaving or, or crashes because the files that it relies on were swapped out underneath it. And these kind of problems um, are just not possible with Flatpaks. And where do, you, where do we get these Flatpaks? So today uh, we're using FlatHub, which um, is a central repository that we've established about a year ago for um, collecting applications in Flatpak format. It has been mentioned a few times in presentations here. Uh, uh, somewhat successful. We have around 350 applications there. It's growing steadily, so there's more every day. And while that's very nice, it is not the perfect fit for Fedora because Flathub um, uh, is very open. We are trying to get as much content as possible into Flathub. That means there's a mix of proprietary applications like Spotify or Skype. And, open source applications like the Game Boy Xscape. And while that, that's great for the users because it's all in one place, uh, Linux distributions like Fedora very often prefer to have a, a clean separation. They just want to enable repositories by default that only have free software in them. So Flatter would be a bit of a problem for them. For that reason, we are also working on um, creating flat packs inside Fedora, basically taking all the uh, Linux distros have packaged applications for, for many years, like everything that you want to install, like many things that you want to install, like the Game Boy Escape or LibreOffice are available as RPMs in Fedora. And those packages have a high quality, so um, it's a natural, not a natural thing for us to try and take that content that's already there and just convert it into flat packs, which is something that we have uh, been working towards and we're very close to actually making that um, work nicely for Fedora 29 this fall. So we'll have a, a nice source of a lot of flat packs that we can enable by default. And uh, that will make the initial experience for Silverblue a lot better. And just have a screenshot here so that this doesn't get too boring. This is um, how flat up looks if you go to the website. Um, you can maybe do that at some point and check it out. So there's a lot of applications there. And what I find when I go there every few, a few days and, and look at it is that it's surprising with 350 applications, there's a lot of things out there that that I didn't know about, even though I've been working in, in 
this context for 20 years and you find surprisingly nice new things just because it's easily available in one place and you have a nice UI to browse through. So that, that's a very nice aspect of this whole initiative. Right, moving on to um, talking a little bit more about how uh, Silverpool works in practice. Um, we use GNOME software just like most other GNOME-based distributions, so managing updates and installations of software. And of course, since we are using Flatpaks for the applications, um, GNOME software supports Flatpaks now. And since we are using OS3 for the OS itself, we also need uh, RPM OS3 supporting GNOME software. And the basics of that are, are there now. So if you if you run the current Fedora Silver Group pre-release, you can use GNOME software to update your OS. That works nicely. Um, and we're working on making that better. So very soon we'll also have support for rebasing the OS, say going from Fedora 28 Silver Group to Fedora 29 Silver Group will also be seamlessly supported inside GNOME software. And something that um, we just recently landed is support for automatic updates, um, which is just something that you have expecting nowadays from your phone or from other operating systems. You don't want to have to manually click through all the updates, but rather um, the system can take care of it on its own and just tell you when it's done. Um, and with Flatpaks, I should step back a little bit and say that that's something that we wanted as an experience for GNOME software all along since we started writing, designing um, GNOME software. But with traditional packages, that is just not a thing that's safe enough to do. I talked a little bit earlier about how we end up in these mixed states, you have a half installed package, or the package that you just installed breaks the running system. And so with, with traditional packages, it's just not safe to automatically update them, and then the system is in a bad state afterwards, maybe. With Flatpex, we're finally at a place where you can safely just install a new version, and uh, nothing bad will happen. So that's something that we just enabled. And uh, we're also working on supporting package layering. I, had, I mentioned that briefly in an earlier slide, say a little bit more about that. It's, it's an interesting difference between OS3, upstream OS3 that enters users and RPM OS3 in that we can, while, while we, have, we want the advantage of an image-based system, um, it makes some things a little harder because uh, either something is in the image that you're using or it isn't. And if you need, say, a quick command line tool for debugging this problem that you ran into, if the tool is not in the image, then uh, you're stumped for the moment. And package layering allows you to actually kind of break the image-based paradigm and still install an RPM on top. The way it works in detail is that um, RPM on street downloads the RPM and then it adds it as a layer on top of the image and composes a new image on your local system, um, which then includes this extra package so you have it available. You still need to reboot to get into the new image. So in that regard, it is still kind of safer and, and image-based. But the image that you have on your system is now a combination of the actual server blue image with the extra packages on top. Um, so you lose a little bit of the, yeah, that's the nice thing of image space that I forgot to mention is that one thing why image based systems are, are good for uh, developing software is that everybody actually has the same bits. You download the image from, from the server blue server and everybody else who does it has the same image. So the um, QA people who tested the image actually have the same bits that you have which makes it a lot easier to uh, diagnose problems and to find out whether the fix is actually effective. Um, and with, a, with package layering, you lose a little bit of that advantage because now you have a locally created image on your system, which is a little different from uh, from the pristine upstream silver blue image. But uh, I would say it's a useful compromise. It makes it a lot easier for old timers like me who are just too used to being able to just quickly install what I need to get by and like, find my way into the new world of container-based workflows. In the ideal future, the way you would deal with a situation like this, where all this one tool that I need is missing, would be to say, oh, oh I'll just like, run this local container that I have where I can install the tools inside the container, so I don't need to change my, my host OS. But I'm not quite there yet. I've been using uh, Silverblue or Atomic Workstation for half a year now, and I'm still finding myself struggling with uh, getting into that mindset, and that's what takes a lot of people who have been doing things for a long time. Change the heads. Um, yeah, so this is um, another screenshot to um, make this a little less boring. Um, here you can see GNOME software. And I earlier showed a, a screenshot of 
GitHub that looks on, in the web browser. And here you can see a similar, like, that's the list of installed applications on my system. And look, look down here, you can barely see it, but here we show now the source where each, where each application uh, comes from. And I think it's barely readable, but it says flat up there. So most of the applications I have on my system were installed from flat up, just because that's the one source of flat packs that we have easily available today. Yeah, so um, the Fedora Workstation is uh, targeted at developers. I would say that's an important target audience for us. And now that we're changing to Silverblue, or that we're building Silverblue, we didn't change our target audience. We still need to support developers and make, make it easy for people to like, get things done on, on the Workstation. Otherwise, um, why would they install it? And I just mentioned that the new world of um, an immutable OS kind of forces you to do your work inside containers that are outside of that. So um, an important set of tools that we need to provide is um, tools for containers. Things like Docker that everybody knows and some of the newer tools that I had on an earlier slide like Podman, Builder, and Scopio, which are all in the same context. They basically do things like Docker, maybe that you build your own containers, that you install containers from like the registry or that you uh, run containers on your local system, and all these tools we, we want to provide out of the box. And also other tools like, uh, I listed a few more here, OpenShift and Flatpak Builder, which is another, uh, another group of tools of around running containers in various contexts. I don't really know too much about that space myself yet, so I can't really explain these in, in super depth, but um, OpenShift is this cluster uh, environment where you run your containers in, in the cloud, essentially. So you just like start it and forget where it runs. And mini OpenShift is a variant of that that lets you set up your own little cluster on your local system so you can test things out locally before you push them into the cloud. And Flatpak Builder is a tool that is specifically targeted at building Flatpaks, which is also container technology in the wider sense, but very targeted at desktop use cases. Right, and we got these more or less standard tools that uh, everybody knows about. We're also looking at doing some things a little more focused for the desktop. Um, so we, we want to ship a toolbox container, which is basically a single container that feels more or less like a traditional developer workstation. So we'll have, it'll, it'll have um, compilers and debuggers and everything pre-installed that you would need to get uh, development use cases handled. And that should be available out of the box and be really easy to like jump into the toolbox container and do what you need to do. And that's something that we'll have hopefully available for Fedora 29 in the first version. And eventually, uh, down the road, we also want to look at uh, making the terminal, the, the graphical terminal that you run on your desktop, work a little better with in, in a container world by providing more context. Basically, if you're very often jumping into and out of different containers because you need to work on different projects, it's very easy to like lose your context. You know, in this container or in that container, so we want to like uh, make the terminal help you with these tasks by showing you in which context you are, making it easy to like uh, launch a new shell in the same container and things like that. But that's that's still a little further down the road. We haven't really um, made much headway on that yet. Right. So now I told you quite a bit about the things we have done or are doing in Silverblue. You may want to know when can I actually try this thing out. And so I put a little timeline here. There is, a, yeah, we start, as I said, we started that earlier this year in spring or February. And for Fedora 28, which was released uh, in May or June, I believe, we actually had a preview uh, install the very first version of Silverblue, which was essentially just the atomic workstation rename. And in the fall of this year, with Fedora 29, we'll have a first actual release of Silverblue, which we had more time to um, put things in place. So that would be a, a good first occasion to try this out. And for our own setting ambitious goals, we decided that by Fedora 30, which is next first half of next year, like in May or uh, maybe June, we want to have Silverblue built out and have enough of the things I talked about in place that it's basically as good as a traditional workstation and there's no big regressions that would make you jump back so that it 
basically is ready for replacing the workstation as a first class operating system. And yeah, with that, um, there's nothing else to say, but there's a few places where you can learn more. Um, as I've said, we, have our own, we set up our own, our own website, uh, silverblue.org, and there's documentation there that we started to put together. Basically, we want to have one, uh, one location where you can go and learn about containerized workflows and how to use silverblue. There's our discourse uh, discussion forum, and of course, uh, FlatHub is the important location if you want to find FlatPacks and learn more about FlatPack. And you can reach out to me via email or on IRC. And with that, um, I'm done. So thanks for listening. If you have any questions, you can ask them now or later. So first of all, uh, uh, I'm not a, a regular Fedora user, but uh, I keep trying Fedora maybe after every three or four months. And whenever I go to the website, I see different uh, uh, options for download, uh, be it a workstation, be it atomic, or, or a server. Yes. Um, and now we have uh, uh, more bifurcation. Uh, the, the atomic host will be there, and now you will have CoreOS and Silverblue. So uh, could you? Clearly define the uh, use cases uh, when one should go for the workstation. Uh, workstation is fine uh, for CoreOS and Silverblue. Uh, that's uh, one question. And uh, second is uh, uh, you have support for flat packs in Software Center. Yes. Uh, a lot of distributions have uh, started supporting flat packs and snaps both. Uh, is there a plan to support snaps, or will it be you, you will stay away from canonical offering? Yeah. Okay, I'll start with the first part of the question. Yeah. Um, there's a lot of different offerings on the website. Yeah. As you said, I mean, traditionally Fedora offers uh, the workstation that has always been basically the main thing that most people install because they all work on laptops. There's a server edition, I believe, and a cloud edition, and then there's something called Atomic Host, which is um, like a very minimal form of um, uh, RPM Austri based uh, operating system that is really meant to just run containers on top. And um, that is getting renamed now into Fedora Core as to, it's basically, there's not going to be one more Fedora Core, it's going to replace it on the course. I mean, there's going to be a long, I guess, uh, replacement period. I think the, the idea is that Atomic Host will still be updated and available at least through Fedora 30, but then it's going to be replaced by, by Fedora Core as for that use case for running a server where you want to have containers on top, or specifically if you want to run Kubernetes. Um, as for Silverblue, I think it, currently it, we're also trying to like do a replacement. As I said, it, our ambitious goal is by Fedora 30 to have Silverblue uh, be regression free, so that it really is as good as the normal workstation for everyday work. And then at some point we want to basically switch over and say the uh, image-based variant is now the primary thing that we offer you. So it's not really not really a separate thing, it's just a different way of offering you the same thing, I would say, which is a little confusing at this point, but eventually we want to switch over and say, just use Silverblue. Uh, the snaps and flat question? Yeah. Uh, I almost tried to get the way without answering that. So, um, yes, um, there's people in Fedora who have packaged SnapD, and I think you can just install it, and you can then install snaps, of course. That, that works as well as it does, I think, on most other operating systems. Uh, I haven't really tried it much myself. I think Snaps are maybe a little less uh, cross-platform than Flatpaks are because you, they, they rely more on things like AppArmor, which are very tied to the kernel, and the Fedora kernel does not have AppArmor in it, so that, that aspect of Snap might not work quite as well on Fedora as it does on a button. But apart from that, it should just work. But for Silverblue, we're trying to make the flatback experience as smooth as we can. Of course, GNOME software will support snaps if you install the, the snap plugin. And so we don't want to exclude that at all. But the focus is currently to make flatbacks work as nicely as we can. And that will also benefit snaps as a, as a side effect, I guess. Because under the covers, the things are have different, similar requirements and uh, needs. Like it's, it's just another way to containerize applications. And, the snaps also need portals, um, the same portals that we use for Blackpack, so um, there's a lot of um, overlap and these things benefit from each other. Uh, 
Thanks a lot. And uh, uh, you mentioned about the terminal support for containers. Uh, it, I, I just want to say thanks. Uh, do work on it. It will make uh, life a lot easier for people using containers. Yeah, I hope so. I'm struggling myself with that, so I'm, I'm really interested in getting that done. Yeah. Thanks. Another question. Uh, I want to. I'm interested in knowing, uh, like, for the firmware updates. How does firmware updates work? At, work on image-based OS because I recently saw like Lenovo is supporting firmware updates via their own software. And so how does it uh, binds around in the context of an image-based OS? Um, you know, it's a good question. I, I don't know that I have fully thought through the details of how that does or does not work. But my understanding is that the firmware, I mean, you feed that somewhere that's outside of yours. So I mean, the firmware update eventually needs to go like, directly close to the hardware that, that uses that firmware. And so it does not become part of the OS image so much. And just works. Maybe people next to you actually know more about this than me. Um, yeah, I actually used the software for this firmware update um, the first time of the other day and the Lenovo support started to come through. Um, and the way it essentially works is it drops um, the update as a EFI capsule onto the, um, the ESP, the, the system partition for the EFI stand. And yeah, that's managed separately by OS3, um, much like Grub would be handled. Um, you know, you need to do the, the switching between the current version and the previous version, that sort of thing. Um, so that just works fine. Alright, if there's no further questions, then thanks again for coming.